Welcome to True Crime 101 with Murder Friends, the podcast where three friends from three different countries talk about murder. My name's Hannah and I'm British. I'm Anna and I'm American. I'm Alana and I'm Canadian. In addition to our longer episodes, True Crime 101 talks you through key true crime cases and theories. We have obviously had a, a little break, uh, unexpected. Um, I had a close family member, unfortunately, lose her life to COVID. So um, we had to, well, I needed to definitely take um, a break from it all. Um, it's very hard to talk about heinous crimes when you're just not like feeling great. So um, thanks for sticking with us and we're back. And uh, yeah, so I'll let you get started, Hannah. Great. I'm going to talk about something really fucking horrible now. I wish I'd picked something <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so I, I don't know if you know, but I have this notebook. And I don't know if I've ever, I've ever waved my new notebook at you or told you about it. But um, it's this gorgeous, like, green, vegan leather. It's, like, biodegradable. Look at it. Ooh, gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's got, like... That's some got, sexy stationery. It's got, like, thick cream pages. Um, oh. It's, like, sustainable. I write all my episodes. Dots or lines? Edgy business. I go for squares. Oh. Mm. oh mm. yeah oh. so um i use like a proper scratchy fountain pen in it as well because it's got like really <laughs> thick paper it's just like it's everything that i want in a notebook and i use the notebook for all of my podcast notes so i put all of my like true crime 101 ideas in it and like everything but this week we're saying fuck you to the notebook because i stole an idea of someone who commented on our youtube channel <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, good. Like, you know what? Fuck it. So I'm going to do Colin Pitchfork and maybe some other fun things about DNA if we have time. So thank you to Leonard who commented on the YouTube channel. Have either of you heard about Colin Pitchfork? No. Mm-mm. No. Okay, um, I'll start with the start of the beginning. So Linda Mann is a 15-year-old girl and she was walking home from her babysitting job on the 21st of November 1983 in the small town of Narborough, Leicestershire. When she didn't arrive, the police were alerted and Linda's parents and neighbours went on a search for her. Her body was sadly found on a footpath nicknamed locally as the Black Pad. She had been raped and strangled. As part of the investigation, they took semen samples. The forensic science available to them at the time was fairly limited. All they could determine was that the person who attacked and murdered Linda had type A blood. They also determined that there was an enzyme profile that the attacker had that only around 10% of males had. But sadly, with no leads, no witnesses, and no further evidence, and the very, very limited forensic science available to them, the case started to go cold. So two and a bit years later, on the 31st of July 1986, Dawn Ashworth, who was also 15 years old, went to visit a friend. She left her friend's house at 4.30pm and began her walk home. She didn't arrive home either. Her parents called the police and a search was launched, but sadly Dawn's body was found two days later in a wooded area off of a footpath. She had also been raped and murdered, and this happened in the same town. God. So as the murders were so similar, same MO, similarities with the crime scenes and the attacks, they compared the semen samples from each murder and noted that the blood types matched, but again, this is as far as forensics could go. They were like, type A blood, that's all we've got. The local newspapers captured the fear in the small community. The Leicester Mercury ran headlines like, a killer in our midst, and articles contained quotes like, if we don't catch him, it could be your daughter next. God. I was fucking terrified. Jeez. I know, they were like, oh, you know, we're really going to scare people. And um yeah, they fucking did. However, this time it was a little bit different because they had a suspect now, Richard Buckland. He was 17 years old and he lived locally. He had learning disabilities. He had been questioned by police and during that questioning he admitted to the murder of Dawn Ashworth, the second um, murder, but not to the earlier murder of Linda Mann. He revealed some details that hadn't been released to the public, but you know, you probably could kind of guess some of them i'm not sure during questioning he would say that he killed dawn and then he'd say that he didn't and then he'd say that he had killed her and then he'd say that he hadn't but police were like i'm pretty sure we got our man so on the 10th of august 1986 10 days after dawn's body was found he was charged with murder police were so sure that they had the the right man for this and they were so sure that he was lying so they took a bit of a, a leap for 1986 and they contacted Professor Alec Jeffries of Leicester University who'd been working on DNA profiling. Basically they wanted to prove that Richard Buckland had killed both of them and they thought if we could use this DNA profiling that Dr Jeffries had been working on they could prove that. Dr Jeffries was a geneticist and he'd been studying how inherited illnesses pass through families. He took DNA from cells 
spread it on some photographic film and developed it like a photograph. And it produced an image of some little like kind of grey bars. Have you seen like the DNA like grey bar things? Yeah. It's like a, like a line and it's got like different shades yeah. of like grey blocks, yeah. So um, I didn't know, I had to look up what DNA actually was because I apparently didn't pay attention in any science lesson. So DNA is actually an acid called dioxyribonucleic acid which I've been practicing saying all day. Wow, that sounds it's... legit. <laughs> I know, <laughs> well um, done. Which carries the genetic code. And this acid, this DNA, can be found in every human cell. So it's quite hard to avoid leaving it somewhere you don't want it to be left because it's in everything. It's in saliva, blood, skin, hair, eyeballs, everything. This DNA fingerprinting or profiling wasn't immediately being used for criminal matters. In fact, Jeffries had first been approached by immigration officials who were disputing whether some children should be given British citizenship because they were struggling to prove that they were the children of British parents, which I think is classic British fuckery right there. That's just fucking worrying on some helpless kids. Anyway, it's a... That's a whole situation. Anyway, um, Jeffries <laughs> yeah. was Jeffries actually gave a talk about this as well, and he said this is this pretty like amazing discovery. And he said, "Well, we could probably use it to catch some criminals." And um, some people in the audience laughed at him. Jokes He's on laughing now. Yeah, exactly. Jokes on those dickheads, because Dr. Jeffries, along with two colleagues, Dr. Peter Gill and Dr. Dave Werrett of the Forensic Science Service, published a paper in 1985 on utilizing profiling of DNA to forensic matters. So they'd been working on pulling DNA. DNA profiles from, and it said, quote, old stains. Ew. Um, <laughs> I never want to hear those two ew. words next to each other. Old oh, stains. No. This is no. Yeah. And Dr. Gill is also quoted as saying, the biggest achievement was developing the preferential extraction method to separate sperm from vaginal cells. Without this method, it would have been difficult to use DNA in rape cases. So they even um, sort of made a technique to separate the, the cells of the victim and the cells of the rapist, which is mind-blowing. So anyway, they took these two samples from the murders and a blood sample from their suspect and gave them to Dr. Jeffries. And the outcome was that the samples from the murders matched, but they didn't match their suspect. And police were super pissed. The senior investigated <laughs> officer is actually quoted as saying, one minute we got the guy and the next we've got jack shit. <laughs> and I was oh, like... God. Imagine having to just properly do your job. That's... <laughs> so terrible. Oh. But imagine getting that like ruled out, you'd be like, oh fuck. I can imagine how pissed off they were. <laughs> so Richard Buckland yeah. was um released from custody and he'd been there for three months. And he therefore became the first suspect ever to be excluded from a criminal investigation based on DNA profiling in the UK. Some articles I read said that he was exonerated of murder. And I get that he'd been charged, but he hadn't been to court, had a trial or found guilty. So I don't know whether that's like the correct phrase. No, that's no. like if you're go to trial, isn't it? You're just that's cleared as a suspect. Like he was yeah. cleared as a suspect. Yeah, yeah, he was like cleared of being charged of murder, but not exonerated of murder. Yeah. No. no anyway, that's um poor poorly written things that I've been reading. Anyway, so that was great news for Richard Buckland. Um, bad news for the police and terrible news for the community. The person who killed Lynn and Dawn was still out there and therefore a pretty terrifying threat. Police decided to go for um, a sledgehammer approach. They had this new technique and they decided if it's been used to rule someone out, then we can use it to rule someone in. So they went mass DNA testing. They call these DNA dragnets. Have either of you heard of those? Mm, yeah. yeah. I've heard of them in some other cases. You don't remember that one that was in... Um Italy with that girl. She was about, I think she's around 14 or 15 and she was in, goes to gymnastics or swimming. They did a huge one in Italy in the town. Yeah. Ended up finding one like the next town over, but they did something similar in that case. Yeah. I um, actually remember in, I think it was like 2005, 2006, we went out on a night out with some friends and it was probably like 3 a.m. And I... I lived like one direction from the bar and my friends all lived the other direction and they were like, do you want us to walk you home? And I was like, no, I'll be fine. So I just walked home because I was 18, 19 and obviously- You still do that, stop. Obviously, <laughs> obviously invincible. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, I was smashed. Like I wasn't even fun drunk. I was like- <laughs> Yeah, you know. Like, I was your house standing up drunk. So I was like, oh, I'm walking home on my own. It was, it was, to be honest, it was very, very close. Um, and the next day, um, there was a, a girl who'd been raped um, at the bottom of my road. <gasps> yeah. Oh my gosh. And they no. did mass, they did um like a DNA dragnet for that. Um and I remember one of my friends they, the police spoke to one of my friends because they were sort of trying to figure out who was in that nightclub because it was closest to the 
to the this place where it happened. Mm. My friend said, "Oh, um, James walked Hannah home that night." That James did not walk me home that night. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they everyone was like called in for like DNA testing. Oh was, my goodness! I was like, "Thanks very much!" Like throwing my soon my my future husband in front of the bus. <laughs> he didn't. Oh walk my me. goodness! The thing is, like, he didn't walk me home. And there was, like, photographic evidence of him walking home with them that night. <laughs> oh. It was just like... Oh, that's how great. Dr- that doesn't sound suspicious. No, that's how fucking drunk we were, though. So that's just the... So, oh, yeah, no. DNA dragnet. Oh, They're not fun. God. Anyway, wow. so they... Um, back to this case. So they wrote to every man born between 1953 and 1970 who had worked or lived in the area and asked them voluntarily to come in for a blood sample. They opened two testing centres, which were open three days a week, and they had two sessions a day, so samples could be taken. Each man was told to bring ID with them, so photographic ID. So, key point, please remember that. Some men refused to give samples. They said they didn't like needles, they didn't like the police, blah, blah, blah. But there was like a shit ton of pressure put on them by the local community because two 15-year-old girls had been brutally attacked, raped and murdered. Fucking men, for fuck's sake. So... All in all, they took 5,511 samples over eight months and none of them returned. Fuck. A, yeah, none of them returned a match. That's a, like, a ridiculous amount, isn't it? I guess in my oh. mind, stereotypically, I was thinking of this little village, you know, thatched roofs and yeah. there's like 10 homes. And you think, oh, you know, it's, it's not going to be that big of a deal. 5,000 It's like samples. an episode of Miss Marple or something. You're like, yeah. she's going to crack <laughs> yeah. it in like 45 minutes. I mean, <laughs> So yeah, Holy so shit. that was in eight months they took that many. And those samples also included suspects that had been questioned previously about, about these murders. It had been about a year after Dawn was murdered. Um, and there were some men in a pub in Leicester drinking pints and doing whatever men in 1987 Leicester did in pubs. Nothing sinister about that. However, in that group of men, there was a man called Ian Kelly. And the group's discussion turned towards one of Ian's colleagues, a man called Colin Pitchfork. Colin was 27 years old, a father of two and a baker. Ian said that Pitchfork had asked him to pretend to be him and go and give a blood sample as part of this this dragnet. And Ian was like, "Mm -hmm, why? And Pitchfork said he'd done the same for a friend who had a sexual crime conviction. So Pitchfork altered his own passport, inserted a photo of Ian inside it, drove him to the test site and waited for Ian to go in and give his sample. Pitchfork had previously been questioned by police during their initial investigations of Linda Mann's murder, the first murder, but he had an alibi. He said that he'd been watching his baby son that night. Six weeks later, someone from that group recounted the story to a local policeman. Ian Kelly was arrested pretty quickly, um, and then Colin Pitchfork yeah. was, again, arrested very shortly thereafter. And police questioned Pitchfork, and he just confessed. Ooh. So, wow. yeah, I, yeah. So, you know, I said earlier, Pitchfork had an alibi. He said that he was watching his baby son. Well, um, in 1983, for the first murder, his baby son had been asleep in his car nearby as he raped and murdered Linda Mann. Oh my goodness. Oh, it just made my stomach turn. There's something else in this story which I'm going to tell you about later that I might have to get you to put your fingers in your ears for because it's fucking disgusting. But um, I'll carry on. And then when questioned about the murder of Dawn Ashworth, the second girl, detectives asked him, why Dawn Ashworth? And he replied, opportunity. She was there and I was there. Oh my gosh. (gasps) so horrible so they tested his dna and they confirmed it was a match for the samples from the murders he also then confessed to two other sexual assaults he pled guilty to two counts of murder two counts of rape two counts of indecent assault and one count of conspiring to pervert the course of justice you know getting his mate to do a dna test for him a psychiatric report was undertaken on pitchfork which was presented to the court and it noted that he had a personality disorder of psychopathic type accompanied by some serious psychosexual pathology. It also said that Pitchfork will obviously continue to be an extremely dangerous individual while the psychopathy continues. So he was found guilty, obviously, and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 30 years. Pitchfork came before the parole board in 2016 and heard the case for his early release. His team argued that he was reformed, that he was educated to a degree level, that he had become somewhat of an expert in transcribing sheet music into braille for blind people. Linda and Dawn's families were unsurprisingly vehemently opposed to his release. However, he was moved to an open prison in 2017. He was spotted walking around Bristol in 2017, which means that he could be having sort of unsupervised day release. 
He was again denied full parole in 2018 and was potentially eligible for parole again last year. But I can't find any information about that. It maybe it was delayed because of the pandemic or or something, but I can't find I can't find any news about it. Whilst he was in prison in 2009, he made a sculpture and it was exhibited as part of the Bringing Music to Life exhibition at the Royal Festival Hall. The sculpture was of an orchestra and a choir and it had been purchased for a trust for around £600. Obviously, victim advocate groups and the media were fully outraged by a double murderer, double child murderer, having his artwork exhibited like this. And it was eventually removed from display. As Pitchfork had pleaded guilty, the DNA evidence was not actually used as part of the prosecution and therefore couldn't be deemed as being tested by a court. Even so, the Home Office started employing technicians and forensic scientists and training them to allow profiling to be added as a routine thing in police casework. The use of DNA fingerprinting profiling was also pretty rapidly taken up by police agencies around the globe. We know it now to be one of the strongest forms of identification when it comes to, you know, forensic matters. So that's the terrible, terrible story of Pitchfork and the murders of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. But I've got some more information about DNA if you're if you're down to listen yeah. to that. Yeah. I think we've got a little, uh, bit, of, little yes. bit of time left. I'll, I'll be quick. DNA dragnets are, are fairly rare now, they're not really used. A lot of countries have a DNA database and most agencies believe that if someone has committed a serious crime, like a pretty serious crime, then they'd more than likely would have been in contact previously with law enforcement. So the first DNA database was created in 1995 and in the UK and in 2016 it held samples from 5.1 million people which was roughly 8% of the population at the time. Oh, Isn't that terrifying? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Further techniques have been refined so much now that obtaining DNA from a suspect can be done from retrieving a discarded item or something that they touched. So the Golden State Killer, I think we, we all know that yeah. pretty well. His DNA was collected from the door handle of his car and a tissue out of his bin, which is bonkers. Although police have obtained DNA in, in other sources from other sources in, I'm going to say nefarious ways. Um, and this is the thing I was talking about earlier that is fucking disgusting and is verging on heinous. So if you want to put your fingers in your ears for like 10 seconds, we'll go through it. So um, Dennis Rader and the BTK murders. Do you know how police gained a crucial piece of DNA evidence for that one? How? Uh, fingers in your ears. The police seized his daughter's pap smear test when she went for a cervical cancer screening <gasps> at university and they DNA tested it. Oh, I have heard that. Oh my God, wow. I had heard that. It yes. so fucking oh, disgusting. So... I hate that. Oh, that's kind of sad. Yeah, it's... it's oh, I hate oh it. that poor girl. Yeah. Anyway, ugh. there is a scientific paper called Accessing Medical Biobanks to Solve Crimes Ethical Considerations, which raises some really thought-provoking points about how ethical it actually is to retain DNA profile for someone. Obviously, whilst your DNA does contain information for identity recognition, it also contains a lot of personal information about an individual as well. The Met Police in the UK, I don't mean that, I mean Met Police in England and Wales because Scotland's different, they say that your biometric information, which covers DNA, but also fingerprints, can be held indefinitely if you're convicted of an offence, regardless of the punishment. So if it, the offence and punishment is quite minor, you, you know, if you get a caution or a warning or a reprimand, you could, your DNA will stay on the system forever. Um, if you're under 18 and are convicted of something, it's a bit different. On your first offence, it can be retained for five years, plus any length of prison sentence. But if you receive a second conviction... They will keep it indefinitely. There was a amendment to how the police store DNA and, and what they can keep. It's called the Protection of Freedoms Act in 2012, and it was implemented from the 31st of October 2013. And prior to then, if you were arrested for something and your DNA was taken, then you were on the database, regardless of whether or not you were charged and or convicted of that crime. There was a case from two men called S and Marpa v. the UK, which was eventually taken all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. One had been arrested and charged when he was 11 for robbery, but he was acquitted a few months later. Imagine taking a DNA sample from an 11-year-old. Oh, my God. Hilarious. Anyway, and the other was arrested and charged for harassment of his partner. However, they reconciled and the charges were not pressed. They both applied to have their biometric data re deleted from the, from the system and the police rejected it. So they argued it and they took it all the way to the European Court of Human Rights and they eventually ruled in their favour and they said... The blanket retention of DNA profiles taken from innocent people posed a disproportionate interference with the right to private life in violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. 
which I think is fucking brilliant. Yeah. So um, Dosh Jeffrey yeah. is a guy that we talked about earlier who first like, pioneered this. He was fully in support of this reform on how police and other agencies hold biometric data. So that also covers fingerprinting. He was knighted in 1994 for the services to science and technology. So that's a little bit about, about DNA. So DNA. Wow. Interesting, that's right? That's really interesting. History. A bit of yeah. history. Yeah. That's what I got. Um, that's, that's awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good. I think I have heard of this case before. Um, now that you started about it, it was like mm. the first one that DNA was used. Mm. I remember, I just remember them doing the, the, the dragnet, the, you know, the DNA dragnet. That's good. Definitely next week, we will release a, a full episode, our first full episode back. And so make sure you listen so you guys can catch up with us and what we're doing and what we're watching and listening. We were obviously in the UK, which we're still in a stay at home order lockdown but boris has dangled a little bit of a the <laughs> right at the end of the tunnel <laughs> but I'm, nobody's getting excited until it happens right so um anyway we will catch up with you guys next week so if you want to check out hannah's sources for today just go onto our website at murderfriends.com um, we do love listener suggestions like today that was great you can send them to murderfriendspod at gmail.com um, you can follow us on Twitter at Murder Friends PD or on Instagram at Murder Friends Pod. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.